Welcome back to the Starting Strength series. It's been a while since we've done an interview, and this time we have snagged an important one. Uh, with me today is Kurt Karwaski, arguably the greatest squatter in the history of the sport of powerlifting. And I know that doesn't flatter you when I tell you that, because that's probably true, isn't it? Well, I wouldn't, I, mean, be, I wouldn't go that far, but well, we did people, pretty well. A lot of people would. A lot of people would. I've got a and cheat sheet all. here. And uh, three-time national teenage champion, uh, seven times USPF national champion from 242 to super heavyweight, uh, 1989 IPF junior world champion, shoots six consecutive IPF world championships, and several other important events. I, the reason I have the little cheat sheet is because I must confess to you guys and to Kirk, I'm not a sports fan and I don't remember sports specific statistics like lots and lots of people do and I realize that a more conscientious interviewer would have prepared better but I just, my mind doesn't work that way. And that's not what we want to talk about today anyway. Kirk holds still the raw squat IPF record, is that correct? Well, no, I hold the 275 pound squat record at 1,003. At 1,003. In, in the IPF, yes. Right. Now, I did an exhibition. The, but the A24 was at a... The, at, at the 2004 AAU, uh, I think it was their world meet, and right. I did an exhibition, and I did a raw squat of 826 with a belt only. No knee wraps, no right. other supportive gear. Do you see how thoroughly I fucked that up? That's why, you know, I'm, <clears throat> I'm not the sports-specific statistics guy. So, at any rate, we are in the presence of Captain Kirk Karwaski today, and we are going to talk to him about lots and lots and lots of things, and hopefully the things we talk about will not have been beaten to death in other, in other interviews, and we'll get some information out of Kirk that, that possibly uh, can help you in your training, you in your competition. Uh, tell me about powerlifting meets and your approach to them. You mean walking in, kicking ass, taking names? That's it. That's it. Your attitude is famous. And I get the impression from being around you that that's your attitude about damn near everything. And it was, and the powerlifting was just an outgrowth of the guy, Kirk Karwaski. Well, was I, that a reasonable assessment? I get pretty intense about things, but powerlifting was my, is my true love. I, I, I wanted to start lifting weights before I ever did. When I was eight years old, I was asking for barbells for Christmas. Um, when I was younger than that, my friend's dads would have a barbell set. I was just fascinated with the whole concept. When did you get your first set? When I was 12. I went behind my mom's back. Grandma hooked me up with that little 110-pound Orbitron set. Concrete plate. Concrete. Yep. It was gold. Mm -hmm. I opened that, took it into the basement. That was a Sunday. Wednesday, there were still wrapped presents under the tree. <laughs> Mom was Nothing pissed. else was interesting. Huh? <laughs> That's what I wanted. That was it. And I just, I knew it was my thing uh, before I did it. I just, there was something telling me to do it. And if I did the best I could, that I, I would do what I managed to pull off. You entered competition in high school. You competed in some stuff in high school. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't powerlifting at first. Well, I, I ran, you know, I did some other sports too, but um, I did some Olympic lifting in high school, but actually I lied about my age. Uh, it used to be you had to be 15. It was the 15, I forget how it was broken up. But I lied about my age to enter my first contest. I was 14 years old. Right. And I was a 165er, a light 165er, and totaled 1120. In the three lift me. Mm hmm. Do you remember what you cleaned and pressed that day? Um, well, that was just a power lift to me. Uh, oh, 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 I say, but the, the Olympic lift. The Olympic meet that you're talking yeah. about, it really wasn't an Olympic meet. It was a, a contest we had in our high school, and it was the most bizarre three-lift meet you've ever seen. It was 
clean and jerk, bench press, and military press. Oh, so it's just a, a deal you guys put together. Right and now. then they had a separate one for the snatch, and it was on your body weight coefficient. Because nobody liked to do the snatch. So, but yeah, in that meet, I weighed in at 202 that day, and I clean and jerked three and a quarter. I clean and pressed 245 and missed a 260. And then I did a touch and go bench with 400. It was my first 400 bench. Weighing? 202. 202. And then on the snatch division, uh, I did a 245 snatch. Wrong. Oh, God, it was awful. Yeah, it makes I've, my back hurt to watch I've, those. I've seen, the, I've seen the videos. But it's a testament to the, to the strength uh, aspect of lifting anything overhead. Yeah. You know, you, you can be wrong if you're strong. Mm -hmm. During that time frame, in the course of that week, I also had done a 600 squat and a 600 deadlift. All school records. So it so was my thing. What we it. have here, and you're quite aware of this, is that you are a genetic freak. The best genetic freak story. Right. Got into high school. And I was 14. I weighed a buck 40. <clears throat> buck 40 nothing. And there was two weight trainer rooms. There was the good room with the good stuff, and then the wuss room. The varsity room. The, right. the wuss room for the girls and, you know, other weirdos uh, with the little universal and some, some of those concrete weights like mm -hmm. my first set. So they tested everybody, and you had to bench press, and you had a deadlift. Well, at bench press, I did a 200-pound bench press, and they were all looking at me kind of funny. And... Deadlift, I didn't really do the deadlift, but it's 300 is what I got. At 14. Uh-huh. Uh, so it's a double body weight plus deadlift. Yeah. But in our school, they had these boards up with various weights. And once you did the weight, you got your name painted on that board. Mm -hmm. Well, you needed to do a 200-pound bench. You needed to do a 300-pound deadlift. Well, you had to squat 300. So a couple weeks later, on the board testing day, I coach... I said, I want to try the squat. So I loaded 300 up, and I missed it. And five or ten minutes later, I said, Coach, let me try that again. And I got a 300-pound squat. And I had not really done them before. Um, <laughs> and I liked it. It was pretty. Once I did it a couple of times, I got it. and I, It was very comfortable, and, yeah. and I liked it. So you were, in fact, a genetic freak. I was and, very fortunate. Well, and we've you know seen the the effects of that. You uh, probably are most famous for the thousand pound double. <laughs> Tell us about the thousand pound double. Those of you that don't know what I'm talking about, just get on YouTube. Karwaski is spelled. K-A-R-W-O-S-K-I. It's not Kowalski. It's Karwaski, 1,000 pound time two. And it'll come up on YouTube. It was a long day. Um, that day actually started the week before when I did 980. And it was, there wasn't anything left. I mean, if a fly had landed on it, it was over. <laughs> so I went through the week and did my deadlift day on Thursday and Saturday I got done benching. As soon as I finish that workout, I'm on to Monday. And I even asked my poor girlfriend, it's like, uh, don't come over this weekend. I'm, I'm just, I need to I'm be alone. sequestered. And I spent the whole weekend sitting on the edge of the couch rocking. Just do one, do one, go into the meat fresh, it'll be easy. Fuck you, you pussy. You can do two. Get your head out of your ass. Angel, you know, the little animal house thing. The angel and yeah. devil. All weekend. <laughs> Couldn't sleep. So Worried about it all week. <sighs> Agonizing over there. Agonizing. I got in there. Everything was going really well. So I take that thousand pound. And I hit the first one, and it was in such a hurry to come up, I yeah. didn't even have to think. Yes, I was, took two breaths. It was on my way back It's the damnedest thing down. I've ever seen. It is the damnedest, the most command of a load with four digits in it that, you, that you'll ever see. Yeah, it was awesome. And 
in retrospect, was it the smart thing to do for the meet? Hell no. Probably not. Probably cost you the third attempt. In retrospect, if I go back in time, would I do it again? Probably. Fucking hell. Probably would, yes. Uh, sometimes. Uh, I used that to. That thing is. <clears throat> those of you that haven't seen this, after you've heard him describe the weekend prior to that set. Watch it again. Watch it with the from the perspective of knowing what he had what he had done, what had gone on in his mind before you see the thousand pounds go down and up two times. And put it in that perspective. But it was, it's yeah, it's a you know, it's a damn good thing somebody had a camcorder, isn't it? Well that whole that whole sequence training up for that double and and the meet afterward is a is a real neat little video that that is available from Kirk. But you've got uh, that was back in that was in ninety five. Yeah, how long had we had camcorders? I can't remember. Well, how long I started we had videotaping camp. every workout in nineteen ninety two. Ninety two. So I something have, was available. I had something. every workout from ninety two. Up but it's the a last great time video. I lived. It's, a, yeah. it's a nice quality video. It's, it's a beautiful record. Of well, the, well, I took a bunch of, the, of that home of footage and we made the cadet to captain video. Yeah, and you know it has some of that high school stuff. It has you know meat footage from a few of the national meets. It's a, it's a very important video. Is that for sale anywhere? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Um, On your Steel, Steel has it. I actually don't have a website. I'm, well, I'm like Jed Clampett here. We got to get you something going on, but. Uh, uh, but still, well, well, I tell you what. In the thread that we will post with these videos, we will put up some information about where to obtain a copy of this video. So you guys just sit tight. We'll get that to you. But back to that squat day. Yeah. And some a lot of people, you know, I've had, you know, well, yeah, you blew the meat because of, because of you know doing that double, and it's like, you know, it's not like I had to worry about the win, and no. it's kind of a surfer philosophy. There are days when you go in and it's there, it's there. and gravity is running scared from the room, and you got to you got to chase it, it out on those days because there you don't know when that next you day don't is going to be. The next day you're going to be on. You never yeah. know when it's going to be Christmas in the gym again, mm -hmm. and when it's there, you, you have to take it. Yeah, if you if you'd put that thing up after the first rep, thinking I need to save this for the meat. I would have nightmares to this day yeah, as to would. whether or not I could have done and it. And what if you'd gotten hurt on the way to the meat? There's a million things that that tell you that that was the right thing to do, despite the fact that it may have cost you third attempt at the meat. But it's, it's a marvelous effort you guys got. It's a, one of the. It's a piece of powerlifting history you've just got to see this this video. Pull it up on YouTube. Uh, you at meats. How did you approach a meet? Well, it's all fun and games. Can we talk to you in the warm-up room? Could we talk to you at weigh no. in? I had a guy, and his sole job was to make sure nobody came up to me. Um, my deal with the meet, once I made weigh in, the jovial kidding around and everything, oh, it, it's, it's time to go to work. I just, just, I just punched the clock. And I'm going to be over in some isolated corner with about 10 feet, with my Walkman on, pacing back and forth, waiting for my coach to say, which means it's time to hit another one. Right. Or when I looked at him, for him to say, you know, you had seven attempts in front of you. Other than that, there, there was no conversation to have. I was in the putting moment. it together. I was enjoying the high. Did you visualize as a tool to prepare for the for each one of the attempts, use the visualization tools. Well, what did, what in, did you do in between each attempt? Like after the opener, my second attempt, I probably had done it seventy or eighty times by the time I came around to the next one. Right, the perfect rep, and especially after being on the platform, not just the driving in the car and fantasizing and thinking about the perfect rep. Now you can actually put yourself in the scene, you know, with right. that so head judge. There are the racks. There's the head judge. Here are the curtains. Don't step this on that the crack set. in the platform. Right. Yes, absolutely. I visualized just, and I just got You'd pissed. already done it 70 times by the time you actually did it on the platform. And I just got angry. I've never understood these guys that can be calm and walk up to the bar right. and, and concentrate. It's like, how can you lift something heavy without being really, really pissed? And 
luckily I was always <laughs> yes. had no problems getting pissed. <laughs> no problems getting pissed off. Did you uh, did you ever do anything in that state that you had to apologize for later? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, there were a, a couple of incidences with you know people like it. it the world championships, the camera people get in my face. What did they? Going off the stage. Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, they're they're doing a tight shot as you walk off. I told you case. once, don't get in my face again. <laughs> no, yeah, because you're still you're still on the clock when you're coming off after the first attempt. I'm on the clock until you're on the, the clock last till the deadlift lift is soon. over. Right. I mean. You know, after like after the squats, you know, you, you kind of lighten up for a few minutes and okay, let's regroup and we have to have some conversations here. And then after that, once you're starting, you're warming up again. It's you know, it's it's back to that. And you know, but luckily there were very few of them because, like I say, I would have a somebody who really and it was like, dude, just you know, I don't want to make eye contact with anybody. I just want to be over here by myself mm -hmm. and. Let me make it so I can do that. Because, you know, I like all these people that are trying to come over and be nice right. to me. But I not do. right now. But right now, it's, it's, no, it's not, not the time. The time. Right. And, you know, I always did feel bad with the, the, those things that would happen. But, you know, it's not it's, like there well, wasn't... Well, it's not like you're being a nasty fucker on purpose. It's, this is the way you approach the sport. No, you know, and it, it shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody, having watched you a couple of times, what what to do around you. In the, well, and in when the, the guy place. whose job it was was to keep him away, said, "Don't go over there." No, really, don't go over there. Oh, I just want to tell him, and it's like, <laughs> no, no, do don't go over there. How did you relate to your handlers back there? I know Marty Gallagher helped you quite a bit. What was your relationship in that context? To the guy keeping track of the table. For Are you me. kidding me? They were my friggin' guardian angels. I loved them. I mean, you know, are you asking now, anything? How, what was the nature of the interaction during that period of time? It was all it, business, right? It was all business. I mean, if there was something important they needed to tell me, I mean, they were going to. If I wanted to know something, but we. Through time, I had the same group, and it became this choreography that would happen. You know, right. meet time. And everybody everybody knew, their knew what job. to do, and and there was there were no questions. And it was it was really it was it was really amazing, and I was very very lucky. Were you good about taking technical corrections? Yes. During during the during the process of the warm up and on the platform, I was. If adamant, he saw something, you needed to know. I was adamant with my people in the gym at the meet. Okay. Okay, yeah. I just did a weight and it was big and, and it looked good. I don't want to hear that. What was wrong with it? How can I make it better? Tell me what was wrong with it. If all you're going to do is blow smoke up my ass and tell me I'm good, I've got no use for you. Right. And so what would get amusing is when things were really smoking, the criticism of that I would get. Um, one of my favorites was my big, huge, 300-pound Big Bob, who was my main guy. He was always behind me, yelling, screaming, making a lot of noise. The best knee wrapper, belt puller, I mean, bar none. And I was coming off the bar, and I had just done something, and I, and I knew. I was like, that was tasty. I can't wait to go home and watch that video. And uh, <laughs> I turned to him and cocked my head, and he goes, your shoes tied, and it's like all to the inside. It's not out in the middle, the knot. And he, well, he turned and walked away real quick. <laughs> I was like, that was the best. That was the best. That's all he could come up with. In that was, day. yeah. <laughs> but, you know, in, in the whole gym, once, once I got my guys doing that, the whole gym that I was at, the Maryland Athletic Club crew, everybody embraced that. Um, we had four women who were national caliber competitors. And, you know, the, the biggest one was a 132-pounder. And we had a 97-pounder, but they're all in that range. And you would see, you know, this little, little teeny cute girls, pretty girls. And there's some big 240-pound guy squatting 650, and he put it back in the rack, and you hear him say, man, that was ugly, dude. 
and, and they'd start ragging them out, and it was like, <laughs> wow. But they felt in, comfortable enough. Everybody embraced in the, the concept of if you're not criticizing me, you're not you're helping not me. Right. There are a lot, a lot of coaches, and I've been around these people for 35 years, lots and lots of coaches, that get in a meat situation. And for some bizarre reason, I have never been able to, to fathom. These guys can only do psych stuff. Yell and scream and you're strong today and all this other all this other non helpful shit. When the guy goes out, makes a blatant error technique wise on his first attempt, needs to hear how to fix it. For Shake the it off, attempt. you'll be alright. Shake it off, walk it off, you're strong today, man. Look. That's not that you're not being helpful. You're not being helpful in this situation. He doesn't know what he did. He doesn't know how to fix it because he was the one under the bar. Your job is to make the mechanical suggestions that can make the second attempt better than the obviously screwed up first one. And you're failing to do that. And I've seen that at the national level. And it's it's absolutely ridiculous. And it's refreshing to hear that somebody at the elite levels understands that, that mechanical corrections have to be a part of what goes on in the warm-up room. And between the tents. You know, because I, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The vast majority of the time. I don't know, and I don't know, I don't think it's as much that the athletes don't want to hear it, that the lifters don't want to hear it, but these coaches, for some bizarre reason, turn their analytic part of their brains off <laughs> and just start telling you how handsome you are today. And that's, you know, so well, it's good to hear that. There's times know. and places. But really, like you say, when there's when there are these things, and it's like, do you know what you did wrong? And and you know, um, like I said, I was fortunate to get people that would embrace yeah. that concept. In fact, that's good. And that's, that's... and I really, you know, um, and it was hard when I first went to that gym. It was uh, late '93, and Big Bob, my my best guy, um, the big tall guy, right? Yeah. <clears throat> when you guys see this video that I'm talking about, when you finally break down together. You're going to see Kirk squatting, and there's there's a guy behind him, a tall guy. And Bob's got a running line of chatter going all the time, doesn't he? <laughs> yeah. He never was in a, in a shortage of uh, insults to hurl. <laughs> but it took me a little while, and, and, he, and I would tell him, you know, I need you. And he's like, you know... You know, I'm a super heavyweight squatting, you know, seven something, and, you know, and, and I'm like, dude, that's not your value. I need you. Yeah. You know, you've got to get it. And then, of course, right. once he started it and he got into it, he got to like it. And he was a sadistic yeah. son of a bitch. Yeah. But nonetheless, I wanted to hear it. And I really, you know, meet situation wherever it was. If I did something wrong, if I wasn't already aware of it. I, you know, and they told me you know, if I thought something was good and it stunk, I was like, "Dude, that looked like shit." <laughs> okay, what'd you see? I'm not, you know, I'm not going to quibble about it. This right. is, you know, I don't doubt that you saw. Tell me, tell me how to fix it. I never yelled at anybody for criticizing me. Um, at least once I got there. When I was right. younger, I was a little different. Right. But um, <laughs> it, it, it really, I mean, it was the the best part of it. You know, it's like. Right. Don't tell us about, you don't want to hear this. Well, tell us about Maryland Athletic Club. It's not there anymore. But no. during the period of time that this, this, this gym was, it's one of these gyms that has the, the thing that Tommy Suggs refers to as the X factor. It's the right combination of people doing the thing such that the atmosphere adds up to uh, more than the people individually would bring. Yeah. And it's uh, that synergy occurs in the room. And we, we had a dozen people that were national and world caliber. Um, and it's not like they were traveling from 100 miles to, to work out there. Uh, it, was, it was really after more than 10 years of being closed. Um, a couple of months ago, somebody called me and said, hey, they're having a Mac reunion. You want to come? <laughs> There's 25 people at this dinner. Oh, God. And we talk about the old times and all this, but I mean, it really it had a big impact on a lot oh, of people, I'm sure it did. and and frankly, on Maryland powerlifting. Um, you know, it was always our equipment at the meets and and all this stuff. But it was it was a great, it was a beautiful thing to to anybody who was there when you get talking about it, everybody gets all nostalgic, and misses it. Yeah, I'm sure. So it was wonderful. Who was there? Who were some of the names we recognized? Well, there was me. Ian Burgess was the owner. 
Um, he competed uh, early on. Um, I think he placed second or third at the men's worlds. Uh, he was like a 132 pound lifter. Um, he had Susie Hartwig, who is a uh, you know, somebody... Legendary you, female powerlifter. God. Legend uh, You can go on and on. She's competed in, I don't know, probably 14 international events. Um, very productive member. A great friend of mine. Um, you know, she's one of my best students, actually. I, she moved from South Dakota out to Maryland because she got the powerlifting bug and figured she'd have a better shot out here. And yeah. she was working with a friend of mine. And she and I, you know, got to be friends, and, and we started training together. And next thing, you know, she's winning nationals. She won the Women's Worlds. She just placed fourth at the Women's Worlds, the IPF, uh, just like a month ago. So how long has Susie been competing? 25 years? Yeah, probably about that 20. The female Ed come. Yeah. Well, and, you know, like I say, she placed fourth, and she's... Sorry, Susie. Yeah, she's 44. Remarkable. But, Remarkable. yeah, um, God, who else? I mean, there are so many people in there. Um, it, it's, and I'm just thinking the, the list. We had Sandy Mobley. She won a few women's national titles. Oh, uh, God. Yeah, I remember her name. Yeah. Um, I'm just, I'm drawn blank. Drawing blank. Yeah. But, but it's, it's one of those places just covered up with, 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 Giants in the sport, and you know you'll find places like that throughout the the sports history. Westside Barbell out in well the the new Westside that Louis got in Ohio. Previous to that, the Westside in in California mm -hmm. with uh, Peanuts West and Friend and who else was out there in that? And just every once in a while, a a, a, a thing grows. Yeah. And it grows around a certain group of people, and they accrete talent, and the thing goes on. And unfortunately, these things all have a lifespan. It works for a few years, and then something will happen, and one of the key people will leave, and things just kind of drift apart. But for a while, the thing worked. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, yeah, it's a lot of gems around like that. We ought to... See if we can make a list of those at some point. But that was a that's a that's a great place to to hear about. I guess it's gone now and Well, when I drove by it and saw that it was a nail salon, I almost drove uh, my car through the front huh. window. But oh. now it is at least it's a sports bar. Well, so at least better. they sell at beer. least people are drinking. And ribs are in there. <laughs> okay. People are drinking. But the nail that's salon I, I, no, I it didn't work. Yeah. Uh Tell us about some of the lifters in the Northeast that you've that you've been around. Uh, did you know, for instance, Luke Eames? Did you ever did you ever know Luke Eames? No, I didn't know. Fascinating him. guy. Fascinating guy. How about Waddington? I never you know, met one. Some of the uh, did, you, did you know Cook? John Cook. I met John Cook a few times. He was a nice guy. I mean, a titan in the sport. Um, I was fortunate enough to get to attempt. To break his total record at 242, and drop the deadlift I needed both times. But anyway, <laughs> um, no, he was an amazing lifter. Oh, absolutely, still a, still a legend. We old guys still revere John Cook. He's just a, just vibrated with strength. The guy was amazing. Yeah, absolutely amazing. Did you know? Uh, uh, you you told me you, you knew George Hector a little bit. George, a friend of mine. Yeah, you'd run into George a little bit. You and he yeah. sound quite a bit. Alike, on the phone, with a couple of beers. Uh huh. It's hard to tell you from George on the phone. Well, when you I, both when, have that Maryland accent. When I really got to know George, I mean, I was just coming in, and I was seventeen, eighteen, and you know, I watched him lift at the junior nationals, and and you know, he just bounced up with a nine seventy five squat, and I was like, my God, <laughs> and you know, um. But no, and he, but he was such a good, fun guy. Yeah, that was one of the things I was like, man, you know. This yeah, is I a wish. Nice the, guy. I wish I've asked George to come talk to us, but George is comfortably out of the sport right now, and he's, mm -hmm. he's happy with his wife and kids. So we're not going to probably get to have a conversation with George about that. But one of these days, maybe he'll get in the jam, and I can send him some money or something. He'll owe me. But 
Well, uh, he, he did the amazing. A great guy. Lost, what do you lose, 100 pounds? Went from 365 down to... Two forty, which, which is what he weighed at the at the Hawaii meet, that yeah. time. and then down to two. So he lost more than a hundred pounds. Maybe it's three fifty five down to two forty two, and his deadlift went up five kilos. And his other list came was right still out big. of his. It, it came right out of his squat. He went down to mid eights squat, but he still had the the bench moved thirty pounds down. But the deadlift went up, and it was just still an amazing. See, mid eight at two forty two. Shame on him. Terrible situation. Huh? But, uh, yeah, George is an amazing guy. Did you know, uh, like, people like Dave Jacoby and... Jacoby. <laughs> um, when I was a junior, you know, when I, when I turned 20, I couldn't go to the Teenage Nationals anymore. So I started going to the Senior Nationals. And Dave Jacoby was the man. And so I had the cover of Powerlifting USA that he was on where he was changing into a Superman uniform in a phone booth. <laughs> Carried that in my gym bag and just stared at it during squat workouts. And I was gonna, I was gonna take him down, I was gonna take him down. And, you know, after a couple of years and being around him, he's too damn nice of a guy, you can't hate the son of a bitch. <laughs> so the picture doesn't work anymore. And anyway, then the envy went away because you can't you can't hate the guy because he's nice. Well, then I finally I've said moved from the two forty twos, and I was a two seventy five, and I finally got to go to the show and go to the IPF Worlds, and well, I'm a teammate with Dave and get to know him better and better, and I told him this. I told you him, told him about I, that. I carried that magazine and I used to throw it around the gym and kick it and and I told him all that and he laughed and laughed and but you know he was just he was amazing he was a truck driver and he trained once a week because he was on the road long haul so he had a couple of places and once a week he'd hit the three main lifts and then like you know he'd stop and do some accessory work maybe another time a week and you know he he pulled off quite a string. I mean, I think four or five IPF World Titles. And Training once a week. Training once a week, driving a truck. Oh and my and God. the guy was packed. I mean, you know, you'd see him in weigh in, and and you know, it's like, are you a bodybuilder? <laughs> but no, he was he was a great guy. Um, I miss Dave. He was a, he was a character. There are a few body, a few power lifters in the in the history of the sport that have ever carried muscle the way you did. Roger Estep comes to mind. Did you ever know Roger Estep? Didn't know him. He died a while back, and he was famous for his physique as well. And I've seen you in shape. And back did, when this was at the loss, yeah, when it had moved up, did you ever consider physique? I hate to even ask you that. There was, there I mean, was one point. You had the tools. At one point, you had the tools. When I dropped from 275 to 242 in 94, you know, there was a little dieting to be had, but I probably could have done a local show and done very well. But oh, I think you'd have done better than very well at a local show. Well, the big thing was this was just a couple of weeks either before the Nationals or the Worlds, and it's like that would have been a fun thing to do. Right. But just to go, just for the hell of it to go do it. But Put on the purple underwear and the brown paint yeah. and get up on there just for the hell of it, just to show them. Well, my, my goal that I had set way back when, when I got real, really rolling, I'm going to win 10 in a row. That was my goal, was to win 10 IPF Worlds in a row. And well, doing a bodybuilding show in amongst that Wouldn't time period is that, definitely not going to help. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, um, but you know, it might have been fun. But I don't know; it's a little too much dining. Right. Getting down to two forty-two was it's hard a little, enough. A little too much psychological weirdness too. Uh, <laughs> I don't see you being tolerant of this. Losing another ten or fifteen pounds, uh, I don't think I couldn't have gone to work. That's for sure. No, it's a full time. I couldn't have been around people. Right. Well, it's it's too time consuming, and you'd have been irritable, a little grumpy, a little bit more grumpy than normal. A little grumpy. Who do you think is there a guy that you could name that has contributed more to your um, to your training philosophy, your success in the sport than anybody else? There are two. Marty Gallagher. Who you know was my lifetime coach, my lifetime friend. I mean, we still hang out, um, still live together a little bit. Um, who you know 
kind of took on this kid that everybody said was too nuts and, you know, wasn't going to do anything. Um, and through Marty, after he got working with me, I met Ed Cohn. And Ed Cohn was another one. Just, you know, I always had more balls than brains. And these guys said, you know, let's start using the brain a little bit. <laughs> and maybe if you're smart, you won't have to work so hard. Right. So right, how, did Ed, how did Ed shape you in that way? Ed, of course, for the people that don't follow this sport that may or may not be watching this interview, is the, probably the, he's the greatest American power lifter of all time. World records in four different weight classes. Probably the longest high-level performer in the sport, in the history of the sport in the United States. Easily. And uh, there's not anybody even comparable to Ed Cohn. Uh, what did he? What did he tell you that helped? Well, what one of the he, big he ones. He focused you essentially, right? One of the big ones was you know I'd, you know you, you'd go all out and you know you're not going to get that <clears throat> fifth rep, but you're going to try it anyway. And he said, "Leave a rep. Always leave a rep." because you don't know when the next week you're going to have a bad week. So if you leave a little extra in the tank, you might have to work a little harder, but it'll be there the following week when you need mm -hmm. it. And, you know, don't beat yourself up. Just, you know, set your plan, make it realistic, you know, and, it, you know, just be smarter, you know. Work on your form more, you know. Don't just... Like I said, you know, don't just go nuts and tear at the bar. Well, if I get a little angrier, it'll it'll happen. Mm -hmm. I need to be more fired up. No. Yeah, it's, sometimes that's not true. No. Sometimes the fire helps you get to the hundred percent. But if you've got so much sight going that you can't effectively use the hundred percent, you know, and I've, I've seen a lot of guys miss third oversight because they oversight. I They're have not, had it happen. Um, where there was a, a period and I didn't do anything. And I'm thinking actually about a few years ago, I did an exhibition at a local meet. And, you know, so I was going to do 600 for eight in the squat with, you know, shorts on a t-shirt. And I got there and there's all these people and it's a meet and, and I got fired up. And I got my Walkman on and I start really getting jazzed up. And I took a warm up and, and you know, it was did something wrong in the warm-up and I'm like oh man I've been getting ready for this thing but I haven't been jazzed up walk man I had to go back in the bag I had to sit down wasn't allowed to pace I'd actually had call down because procedure. because oh. I, I couldn't handle I couldn't <clears throat> handle the adrenaline ride I wasn't mm -hmm. tuned with it what did Ed tell you that helped you at the meet that was that was that was a training. It's good advice. Leave a leave a rep on the bars. Right. Oftentimes, a good advice. Before you tell me, what would he have said about that thousand pound double? What do you think he'd have told you about that? Were he there that day? He told me that it was pretty badass, and he would have done it too. Did he? Yeah. What did he tell you that helped you at the meet? Um, always open light. Um. As far as actually at the meets, unless it was like a direct, like he saw something and came up to me, uh, I had pretty good attempt selection ideas and things, um, you know, f for the meets themselves. So, you know, really it was, it was more of the training stuff. Right. And at the meets, you know, it would be things, specific things, like, you know, there was a meet and he lifted and he actually missed an attempt because the platform was spongy. So he said, when you go up there, make sure that they pulled this back over the support. So mm -hmm. generally it was things like Just that. specific stuff about. Although, well then there was there was one of the one of these key ones uh, in 1990 my first men's world championships. I was finally at the real show and I was taking on a three-time defending world champion Kiosti Bilmi. And I set a world record squat and then I missed my third. I was going to break that record. Tied a PR bench and I'm deadlifting and Bilmi was a better deadlifter. And he was a good squatter. Essentially, we were tied. So after the first deadlifts, we're tied. 
So we call the second attempts. And I knew what he had pulled before. I had, I had done my homework. And pulled mine, he pulls his. So I went to call for my third, and Ed comes running up. What are you calling for? And I told him, and he goes, not enough. His deadlifts always look like that. You need to pull more than that. So I went up, like five kilos, something I'd never done before. And I'm scared PR shitless. For you. I remember walking out to the bar, and I remember the song that was on the Walkman. I mean, I can remember this like yesterday. And I stood over the bar, and the crowd was just tearing the place apart. It was awesome. <laughs> Pulled it, put it down, and stood there for a second. And I'm like, this is what it's like. <laughs> and I couldn't believe it. And I rolled off the platform. A few minutes later, I'm around in front and watch that son of a bitch pull what he needed to do. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> I was, oh, God. there was not a thing on this planet that gave me any pleasure or happiness for the next entire year <laughs> until I got back at it. I was so upset. Um, but anyway, he was, he was right. But that was one of those Eddie things that I always remember. I remember him running up, no, 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 you got to pull more than that. Yeah. Well, damn it, why didn't you tell me to pull a little more? But anyway, it was, that was one of my funny Eddie, cool Eddie stories. Yeah. You and I were talking at lunch about uh, a really nice little piece of advice that you have for for people in terms of focus. Focus is a, uh, I, I guess you're probably your strong sweet. You're you're a, a great psychological athlete, and I like what you said about the twenty seconds. Just manage to put together 20 seconds where you go out, take the bar out of the rack, squat it, put it back in the rack, and during that whole entire 20 seconds, merely fail to fuck something up. Just don't fuck up for 20 seconds. That's, that's good. That uh, well, distills the... And it's not as easy as it sounds. Well, well, where Think of the distractions that every human being has to deal with from all these senses coming in, none of which are useful in that period of 20 seconds. I'm picturing faces of people I'm helping in a meet, friends of mine. They're in the gym every, every workout, same time, and they're good lifters. You know, we're, we're at the state meet, maybe. And, you know, they just hit a nice hit a second attempt. So maybe it's a little off, but they're, they're going for a personal best. And they're like, you know, what do you think? And, and you can tell they're, they're rattled. And they're like, oh, you know, I kind of don't feel that good today, this and that. And I'm like, what is your point? <laughs> and they're like, well, what do you mean? And I'm like, none of that matters. What do you mean none of that matters? None of it matters. Because unless you're a dumbass and you take 10% more than you can actually lift, if you're taking a reasonable attempt based on your training, whether you don't feel good today, um, whether you don't like the platform, whether you, your girlfriend isn't wearing the outfit you wanted her to wear. I don't care what it whether is. Whether the shoelaces are off to the side. Whatever. All that matters, can you get yourself prepared, get your knees wrapped, whatever you need to do. Can you get prepared, go to the bar, set yourself up, and once you start that process can you not fuck it up for 20 seconds if you can manage to not fuck up for 20 seconds can you keep your head out of your ass for 20 <laughs> stinking seconds <laughs> do everything right no 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 the bullshit matters because right. that will happen it's destined to happen it's up to you to screw it up right and you're prepared all... for it and as a result of the preparation you can do it if you don't screw the pooch <laughs> So, and, and, and I would get, the first time I would say that to somebody, they would always give me this bizarre blank stare. And generally the response was, I never thought of it like that. And you would see right. a, a change. I mean, and it worked so well. It was such a cool thing to say. And the people who got it, you would see a change in their whole demeanor and confidence level. It's up to me. As long as I don't screw up, I got this. It's not if I screw up. It's if I don't, 
concentrate <laughs> that. It's a positive <laughs> thing you're po you're focusing on at that point. Right. It changes everything, and I've seen the demeanor change. And I've been like, man, that was cool. I don't know where I came up with well, it. You know I've what's good it. about that is it gives them a procedure to focus on. All I have to do is put one foot in front of the other. And all these little mechanical things that I've been training for and know how to do, I just have to execute without, without letting anything interrupt that process that I have, in fact, perfected already. Exactly. And, it's, and it gives you a way to approach it in a positive way to actually affect the outcome of the, of the lift. But it only works the way I say it. Right. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. And there's something about being told it by you that makes it even more effective. Well, yeah. How many people have you coached? God, I, I couldn't count. I mean, if I was around the gym... Are you still working at meets with people? No. Unfortunately, my job now, <laughs> I'm stuck with weekend work. So I'm not able to get out enough. And, you know, haven't really been out. But, you know, I have people that I converse with. Um, I, have, I still have friends that call me and, you know, hey, what would you do about this? And um, now with the cool new technology, I mean, I do. I have, you know, people that have, that have hit me up, you know, old friends' emails and, you know, they send me videos and things like that. Hey, what do you think of this? And, you know, uh, it, it's so much better than the old days of mailing right. VHS tapes back and forth. <laughs> right, and everybody's got a phone and everybody can send you video now. And it's, a, it's quite a useful advance in technology for, for us because we can... Uh, the data is available. Yeah. We didn't have the data 20 years ago. Now, I don't like to coach people on the Internet uh, for a couple of reasons. I don't like to, I don't like to make, uh, I don't like to say that I'm coaching because really if all I see is some information in a post and, and I talk to a guy on the phone and, and uh, he tells me what he's doing and all this other stuff, and I can't see him actually do the movements, I'm not really coaching. I'm doing program consultation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I like to coach in real time. If I'm going to coach a set of five, I need to see the first rep, and then I'm going to have some feedback that will affect the next four. And if I see the video after it's done, then I don't feel competent to in fact, I don't feel good about taking people's money for that. But there are a lot of things that can be obtained over the phone in a program consultation that aren't really the same thing as real-time coaching feedback that are very valuable for people's training in terms of making plans and in terms of arranging programming and stuff. And I think that's something that, that, that you ought to be capable of doing, and I really think I'd like to encourage you to to start doing that because a lot of people need your help. Uh, what do you feel that you're best at in terms of helping people prepare for a power meet? Set up and form. Those are my, my mm -hmm. you know, um, I was always the strong kid, but until I started really focusing on those kind of details um, and, and that that's that's what I always preach, and anybody who I've ever coached or helped, um, you know, it might have been ten years ago. If they came around now, and I was talking to somebody and and helping them, they'd hear the same thing. And and I've heard this over and over, and I've actually heard it secondhand. You know, like I'd meet somebody, I'm like, I got a friend, and he trained with you for a while, and I'm like, hey, I remember that guy. And it's like, you know, I you know, boom, 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 and the stuff that I've taught people has moved to the next level, to the next level, mm -hmm. and, and it's moved down a couple of generations. Right. And I just, I'm like, you know, wow, I actually, you know, I did, I did my thing and I've got my credentials, mm -hmm. but I actually impacted and helped. And to me, that was that was a, that was a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know that you know the stuff. You know, yeah. I'm not, not just an ape that was able to do it. I mean, right. I was able to help some other people do right. it. And, yeah, Contribution was, cool. was more than just your performance. Well, I wouldn't be who I am without lifting. Believe it or not, I was a shy, insecure, fat kid. I didn't like being around That's a lot of people, and and I didn't want to talk to people I didn't know, and I was worried about looking silly. And you know, I'm like, I wish I could be relaxed and you know, not worry about that stuff. And you know, well, I saw the 
Incredible Hulk and, you know, wanted my barbells. And I'm like, <laughs> that, that'll take care of all this. And yeah. here we are. <laughs> but, um, no, and, and, you know, to be able to help some other people do that, um, you know, it's an awesome sport. I love it. Where do you see it going these days? Powerlifting is, you know, I really got... Oh, I, you know, this is this is largely irrelevant since we're talking to you, but I, I retired from lifting at 88 because I was to the point where I had to make a decision about where I could, could I go up and what would it take to do it, and I decided that it probably wouldn't, the gyrations it was going to take just probably weren't worth it. About that same time, the late 80s, the, the sport was going through a very, very large transforma transformation in terms of equipment, and judging and federations developing and markets were being established for shirts and I'd never even had a shirt on and I wasn't interested in learning how to use a shirt. Uh, I'd had my little 10 year run and I was and I was through and all through the 90s when you were when you were lifting sweeping changes in the in the face of the sport occurred and you and I have talked about this at some length, and and let's just go ahead and ask you: What do you think about? What do you think about the direction the sport is headed in the past fifteen or twenty years? I wish everybody could come to some sort of a conclusion and unify, and take this sport up to the level so somebody can get an Olympic medal out of it. I know that a lot of people, oh, yeah. but really. Um, it's it's a shame that it's it's become so factionalized the way that it is, and yeah, I, I mean it's everybody knows I'm not a big equipment guy. Uh, the equipment that I wore, I, you know, I loved and I loved my equipment guys, you know, Titan, in in them. Um, but way back when, time frame you're talking about, I remember when the equipment started popping up, you know. Um, we all hated the super suits to begin with, oh, God. but then, oh, then God. They, they start making more things and more things, and it's like, you know, what are they going to come up with next? And lo and behold, you know, they, what are they going to come up with? Power, underwear, ha, 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 six and, months later. And there they are. And Socks. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, this, all this silly shit, it's just, it has, it has so thoroughly transformed from what it was then to what it is now that it really has lost my interest. Well, it's, powerlifting it's, really has, is, there are, it's become, when you look at the top 100 in the powerlifting USA, um, it really has become to where, in all fairness, they need to make some notations or something, and then it starts getting yeah. complicated because... A bunch of asterisks up the side of each one of these numbers is what they need. Because and, when I did my raw meet, raw was... Belt only. Right. Okay. Now raw. Now is raw includes knee wraps. knee wraps. And it's like, well, if I wore knee wraps at that thing, I would have squatted nine. Um, anyway, and, and this isn't about me. Um, personally, I I lifted in that raw meet, and I had been off the platform for eight years, and I showed up, and I actually made a comment to somebody. I'm like, what if I walk out there and get stage fright? <laughs> and they looked at me and said, what? And I'm like, how weird would that be? Uh, but anyway, I stepped on a platform and I was like, wow, it's home. But getting ready for the squat, instead of that five attempts, sit down, start wrapping the knees. You know, have to worry and, about time and all. By the time you get to the bar and you've gotten all, all your stuff on and you're ready to go, you're exhausted already. But in the, at the raw meet, it was... You're on deck. Here's your belt. Okay. Back. Take the belt <laughs> off. I hardly got winded. So, it was awesome. <laughs> it was so much fun. In 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 my personal, uh, you know, I like the 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 raw thing. Um. So anyway, <laughs> the uh, that's my personal. I know right. everybody's going to do their own thing. But what do you think about? An 850 bench being talked about as though it is something 
that you should have been able to do. You understand what I mean by that comment? Well, I've, I've had, had people I've, 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 say the you, th you thrown around like it, it just cavalierly say, "Yeah, he benched 850." I, since I, I haven't I, used any of those, I just I don't get it. Um, I'm really amazed nobody's really gotten killed. Killed. Um, I can't, you know, really, I mean, I was a good bencher, but you know, an 800 bench, I wasn't even, not, wasn't yeah. even in the cards remotely. And, you know, I'm just trying to think about holding that in your hands, and I don't know. Um, like I say, it, it's, it's really become a very different thing, and I don't know. With, the shirts is one thing. Because at least the bar is going down and touching the chest and being locked back out. Mm -hmm. um, it's a little disturbing that with the squats, you don't even have to walk them out anymore. But then to squat four inches high and have that be counted, that's disturbing. I mean, that's shameful. I have seen the videos, and uh, it's it's just absolutely amazing that the officials in the federation in which this occurs have got the balls to call that a deep squat and it's I, it's not the same thing you did and it certainly is hell in the same thing i did and it's just not i mean what's the point i don't really see the point the most it. disturbing part about it is you see this and you're like oh my god they really counted that and then the YouTube posts. That was the deepest squat I ever saw. And it's breeding generations of, of people, people who don't know what the hell really have no concept where this sport started. Right. And if, if that's where it evolves, I mean, okay, whatever. But at least at least know where it began and what an actual deep squat was. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like I say, some of the some of the stuff uh, I. Like I say, I'm not going to disparage anybody, but really, the, you know, the high squats. It's not the same it's, thing. It's not the same thing. It's not thing. the same thing at all. And it counts. And here's the most disturbing aspect of it to me, Kirk, is that those things count for total. And you've got these totals now. Didn't somebody that, do? That's, yeah, that's, they've gotten so that's high. It's just bizarre 2,600 pound totals. And stuff. They've gone and, above that. Yeah, they have. Way above. And and they're all predicated on the idea that that is a squat, and it's just it's disturbing to me. The mono lift. What do you think about the mono lift? Well, I know what everybody everybody says. Oh, it's safer. And frankly, with the mono lift, I remember when it came out. I actually trained on one, but I walked out of it. Um, there were guys. Uh, you know, everybody talks about you know this the great squatter thing, and you know I did my job well. But there were guys that could squat a thousand pounds. There were several of them. They just couldn't manage to set couldn't, it up. Couldn't walk it out and set it up. My whole gimmick was that I could manage to set it up so I could give it a ride. These guys just weren't able to to do that. They could ride the ride the thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my personal opinion. Um, I, I don't like the mono lift. I mean, it takes away the hardest part of the lift, which is the set. The integral part of the lift. Standing up, walking back, demonstrating control over the load at that level. Riding it down, standing back up with it, and then getting it back in the rack. Those are aspects of the, of the lift that are, if you'll remember, Chip McCain. Chip McCain squatting in the... In the low eights, mid eights, at eight forty three comes into my mind for some reason at at two twenty. Back long years ago, and Chip's biggest deal was that if he could get the thing out of the rack, if he could get it on his back and get it out of the rack and manage to get it set up because he was, you know, he he was real wobbly and real. If he could get it set up, he could squat the weight. But the, the adventure was watching him get that thing out of the racks and not kill him and all the spotters and the judges in the process. Well, and I, it was yeah. it was an amazing aspect of the lift that the mono lift just 
it eliminates from no, the process. No, it does not. And what's really scary to me is you see the guys that are in the monolift and they stand up and those things move and it looks like he's lifting on an earthquake while he's standing there locked out. Right. And I, I've got to give them credit because they've got more balls than me because I, you until I'm that. stable, I can't bend my knees. But, you know, you see some of these things and you think you're about to see a train wreck. And, you know, they managed to get down and they yeah. managed to come back up. But, uh, you know, and here again, it, it, you know, if that's where this evolution is going to go, the top 100, you know, has to have the little M because it was done in the monolith. Mm -hmm. It needs to have a four because it was a four ply, uh, you know, it, it's, it needs to be there. Right. And, uh, you know. Yeah, you can't equate the two performances. Because really, if you look at the equipment that I was wearing in the day, because, you know, if, you know, if you went back to 15, 20 years earlier, well, you know, those guys could say, what is this shit that you're wearing? You know? Yeah. Um, really, you know, Kazmaier right. with, the, with the original Ben shirt could have said mm -hmm. that, you know, things are changing. Uh, you know, I personally, it's not my gig. Uh, you know, it's mm -hmm. not what I'm into. But, um, you know. Yeah, it's a, I see a lot of movement in the right direction, though because of the reaction to the extremes in equipment use that we're seeing. Do you, are you familiar with the raw unity Well, it's, it's one situation? of the reasons they talked me into doing the raw meet in 04. Mm -hmm. My training, it just so happened I was just having a real good few months, and I was in good shape, and things were going well, and this idea came up. And I'm like, yeah, okay. And, and, you know, the raw thing was, you know, moving and progressing. And it's like, you know, maybe we can, we can help push. And, you know, I was actually really proud because, you know, everybody made a big to-do over yeah, it. I think it created and, some and interest. And I think in it helped the... a little bit. And I was, I was I'm really proud of being able to, you know, throw my two cents in on that. shove the sport in what I consider to be the right direction. You know, it's a, I'd, I'd like to see less money spent on suits and less money spent on shirts and more emphasis placed on a set of squat stands and a guy standing up with the weight and walking it back out squatting with it putting it back up like it was 35 years ago. Good old retro lifting. Yes. Absolutely. What do you think about novice lifters getting into the sport right now? What do you think their best you know, a guy's been training a couple of years, he decides he wants to go to a power meet. What's your advice to him? Find somebody who's been around. Wait on equipment. I'm not, I'm not trying to be preachy or anything, but I've seen people show up in the gym and within six months, they've got knee wraps and super suits on, and they haven't even, you know, this is a 200-pound guy, and he hasn't squatted 405 yet. But he's got all the gear for a 700, right? Put some, put some time and work in. Do your Build homework. some base strength, for the love of God. I mean, I'm trying to remember. I think I squatted. I made myself wait until I squatted 700 to get a wide belt all the way around for the first time. That was my belt. thing. When I squat 700, I'm getting a, a real belt. <laughs> that was your reward. And, but you, but it was a way to make yourself do the do right. your homework. You need to the put some time in. The homework has got to be done. As a novice lifter, go to a meet. Watch a meet. Look at what you're getting yourself into. Don't just show up at a meet because it's it's you know it can be quite a deal. Mm -hmm. Make sure you have somebody who's been around a little bit. But you know, put put a little time in before. You, you 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 start putting all the equipment in. I mean, it, I, I, to me, I, I find that really important because I do. I see too many people just jumping in, and you know, within a year, they're wearing you know the the the, the hardcore heavy duty equipment, and it's like really, you know, you're 240 this pounds. Is, you haven't even benched 350 yet. Right. And they they don't understand. No. They think the sport is about the equipment. And that's probably the most tragic aspect of the equipment thing, I think, is that immediately people associate 
powerlifting with all this gear. Well, and that's not the way it was. There really probably could be the third place guy who should be third place, who does have the better, you know, the be the better piece of equipment, who's beaten the other ones. And you know, see, to me, that's kind of where it changes from this strength sport. I'm stronger than you, so I beat you. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's lots of technique and everything involved, but it's become more of a, a technical. It, it, it's it's different. Oh, at that oh, point. I, I see what you're saying. I don't I don't dispute the fact that powerlifting that one of the interesting aspects of powerlifting is the correct use of the equipment. It's a technical sport in many ways that's much more technical than Olympic weightlifting because there are more variables. There's another lift and there are more variables in the training. All that stuff's got to be dealt with. And if you're going to correctly use the equipment, uh, powerlifting at this point, at this level, is a much more technical sport than Olympic weightlifting. Absolutely. But when the equipment becomes the focus then it's gone to a place that I just wasn't interested in following it. Yeah, you know, like I say it's it's really you know. it's it's become different. Mm -hmm. And you know, I like I say, I the little the stuff that that we used, you know, added, and you know, with the new thing and and I you know I don't know maybe it is just a matter of degree, but but the things I see with judging and stuff now maybe I'm. Well, and poor and judging is poor judging. Poor judging is poor There's judging. no technique to that. Right. There's a technique as somebody ought to kick you in your ass, mm -hmm. um, you know, for passing that. Right. But, you know, and, and really, you know, the, the big equipment stuff, it's fine. But for the love of God, if, if you're going to do a squat, squat the way, the quarter squat thing, mm -hmm. that's not cool. But well, what do you do? Maybe we're just going to... Well, it may very well be <laughs> that the sport has just taken a new direction, and who are we to argue with it? But, you know, I'm glad you were there, and I'm glad we got to see you do the things we, we got to see you do. And uh, once again, I'm, I'm pleased to have uh, been able to, to bring well, thank Kirk you. down here and uh, do another starting strength series interview with Kirk Kerwaski. Thank you guys for being with us today.